Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Monty. He was born last year, and he is my godson's uh, uh, second child. I think that makes me a great godfather, which also makes me feel rather old. Now, in Monty's lifetime, one million species of plants and animals will go extinct. The International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the scientific body that advises the United Nations on nature, has examined a huge body of evidence and concluded that by the end of this century, when Monty will be in his 70s, at least one million species will be extinct, gone forever. Now, this is likely to include rhinos, lions, elephants, and even our closest living relatives, the great apes, like this orangutan. And all of this because of the actions of just one species. Yes, you guessed it, it's us, Homo sapiens. What's more, this represents an existential threat to our very own survival as a species, due to the destabilization of vital planetary systems that will result from this incredible loss of biodiversity. Now, I'm sure most of you have children in your own extended families, like I do. How does this biodiversity crisis make you feel for their future? If you're like me, you'll be sad, angry, frustrated. Perhaps you feel overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. At the end of the day, is there really anything I can do to help? I'm Simon Dowell, and I am Conservation Science and Policy Director at Chester Zoo, one of the world's leading conservation zoos based here in the northwest of England. As a professional conservationist, I have dedicated my career to preventing extinction, and my aim today is to give you the power to join me and take action to do something about the biodiversity crisis. So, the science tells us that biodiversity loss, that is to say the mass extinction of plants and animals, is an existential threat to our very own survival. Now, in many ways, all of us have recently faced an existential threat through the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, the causes of COVID-19 in itself are closely linked with habitat loss and with the exploitation of wild animals for food, which is believed to be the source of the original transmission. The existential threat the pandemic posed to Chester Zoo was very stark because 97% of our income comes from visitors. And during the lockdowns, we were forced to close, so our conservation work ground to a halt. So, we're back in June 2020. Chester Zoo has been closed since the 23rd of March with no regular income, and the CEO is summoned to a virtual meeting of zoo leaders with the government minister responsible for zoos. There is speculation that we're going to be allowed to open again and resume our vital conservation work. So as I wait patiently for news, I dare to think about how we can rebuild our conservation work and plan for the future. But when news comes, it is not good. Zoos are to remain closed indefinitely and with no prospect of financial help. This is devastating. We face the very real prospect of going out of business. What will happen to our animals? What about our dedicated staff? And what about our conservation and education work? We're angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, but not helpless. Within days, we launch a public campaign, Save Our Zoo. It raises three million pounds in two weeks. But what's more, our wonderful visitors and supporters take to their keyboards and email their members of parliament and supporters of other conservation zoos around the country do the same thing. MPs' inboxes are inundated with thousands of letters in support of zoos. I get together with my counterparts at the country's major conservation zoos, and we write a report on the societal value of zoos, using case studies and evidence to demonstrate the huge contribution that we all make to species conservation and also to the welfare and well-being of our visitors and communities. 
we email this report to government and MPs. Together, all this culminates in a debate on zoos in the United Kingdom House of Commons. MPs from all parties speak in support of zoos, using direct quotes from our report. So less than two weeks after that bombshell from the zoos minister at the meeting, the government U-turns and zoos are allowed to open their outdoor areas to the public again. Relief all round. At last, we can reopen our doors and start to recoup some of our losses and get back to our important conservation work. But what did this tell us about our influence? Well, it demonstrates that zoos like ours have a powerful voice and it is supported by the public who see the value and benefit of our conservation work as well as providing an outlet for the desire to connect with nature at a time when this is needed more than ever before. And we quickly realised that reversing the government decision to keep us closed was not the end goal, but just the beginning. Because now we face an even bigger existential threat through the nature and climate crisis. And as conservation practitioners on a grand scale and with an enormous following from the public, we have a responsibility to raise our voice and use our influence for wildlife. After all, the people that supported our campaign through the pandemic expect no less. Otherwise, what did they save us for? So having found our voice, how are we using it? And how can you join in? Well, zoos are standing up for nature in a wide variety of ways. Through our conservation breeding programs and our cutting edge science, we are building up insurance populations of hundreds of species on the brink of extinction. Zoos also work in the wild all over the world on groundbreaking field conservation projects that utilize the expertise that comes from caring for wild animals at close quarters. At Chester Zoo, for example, we support over 60 projects in 19 different countries across the globe. And zoos reach at least 700 million visitors across the world every year. And our educational programs engage the public in powerful conservation campaigns to encourage more sustainable living. And we are increasingly speaking truth to power lobbying governments and international bodies such as the United Nations to build nature recovery into their policies and actions. I want to tell you about one very powerful example of how all this works together. One of the most iconic animals that we have at Chester Zoo is the orangutan. In fact, we have two species, Bornean orangutans and Sumatran orangutans, and both of them are part of Europe-wide breeding programs to provide insurance populations. As one of the great apes, we share 97% of our DNA with the orangutans. But orangutans are endangered and they face substantial threats to their continued survival on planet Earth. Now, they come from tropical rainforests in Southeast Asia, and they share these with many, many other species. In fact, their forest home is one of the most biodiverse habitats on the planet. But their habitats are under threat from deforestation to make way for agriculture, especially plantations that produce palm oil. Palm oil is the most widely consumed vegetable oil in the world. It is derived from the oil palm, a tropical plant originally from West Africa, but now grown across the tropics, especially in Southeast Asia. But what is palm oil used for? Okay, so how many of you brushed your teeth with toothpaste this morning? Put your hands up. Gosh, I'm really relieved to see everybody's put their hand up in answer to that question. Uh, you might also have had a shower and used soap or shower gel. I really hope you did that as well. And perhaps you've had a biscuit with your morning coffee. All of these products most likely contained palm oil as a vital ingredient. In fact, palm oil is used in around 50% of packaged supermarket products. And these include many manufactured and processed foods and also many hygiene and cleaning products. But palm oil plantations have many negative impacts. And these include forest fires, soil erosion, and pollution, and above all, deforestation on a massive scale. 
So palm oil is a disaster, and the solution is to ban it, to save the rainforest, right? Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not that simple. If we don't use palm oil, then we'll need a suitable alternative, we'll need a substitute. Where will we grow that, and what environmental impact will that have by comparison? Compared to other vegetable oils, palm oil is very high yielding. We would need to convert a lot more land if we used any of the alternatives. Also, many lives and livelihoods depend on it. For example, in Indonesia alone, four and a half million people are directly employed in the palm oil industry. Now, recently, I visited the Malaysian state of Sabah, which is in northeast Borneo, where oil palm plantations are found between surviving fragments of native rainforest. Some of these plantations are certified by the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil, or the RSPO. And this means they must adhere to strict environmental standards, including a commitment to no more deforestation, so that only land that was cleared before 2018 can be used to plant oil palms. There are social benefits too, as certified sustainable plantations must look after their workforce and also commit to providing decent accommodation and paying a fair wage. Furthermore, with the help of our conservation partners, a wonderful local organisation called Hutan, you can see me with some of them here, these sustainable plantations are replanting rainforest corridors between the oil palms to connect up fragments of rainforest and allow wildlife populations to link up and recover. But do these really work? One answer to this, to this came during our visit. I'm in an oil palm plantation, being shown around by the owner. To our left is a mature plantation, a forest of straight trunks, green but sparse and rather lifeless when it comes to wildlife. But to our right, the owner is pointing out the native rainforest trees of 30 different species that he and his colleagues have planted along the river that crosses the plantation. And they're trying to create a corridor of native forest. As we pass in the vehicle, my eye is caught by a grey shape between the green and then another. Elephants! Wild elephants are moving through the corridor. When they see us, they cross the river and we get out the vehicle to take some photographs. Wow! I can barely contain my excitement and I struggle to hold the camera steady. In fact, it's a wonder I got this photograph in, in focus. What an enormous, priv enormous privilege it really is to see these majestic animals. Later on, the scientists at Hutan share their data and they show us just how many species, not just elephants, also orangutans and many others, steadily return to the forest corridors and the recovering rainforest patches as they mature. So, when managed sustainably, oil palm plantations can actually benefit wildlife whilst providing an important commodity that we need for our daily lives. Currently, however, only 19% of palm oil is certified by the RSPO as coming from sustainable sources, whilst the majority is produced in ways that are still contributing to deforestation. So this is where our influence comes in. We are all consumers of palm oil in the products that we buy. Palm oil is almost impossible to avoid, as it is in so many of the products that we use. But we don't need to avoid it, if we switch to using products containing sustainable palm oil. If we can drive up the demand for sustainable palm oil in our everyday items that we buy, then ultimately wildlife will benefit. But how do I know which products and companies that produce, produce them are sustainable when it comes to palm oil? The RSPO has a logo for certified sustainable palm oil, but unfortunately, this is not always used on many products. So zoos have come to the rescue because we know we cannot prevent extinction of precious wildlife like orangutans without unlocking the power of the consumer and consumers are also our visitors and our supporters. Working with the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums and with partner zoos in the USA and New Zealand, we have produced an app, Palm Oil Scan, that you can use when you're shopping. 
The app allows you to scan the barcode of the product that you're thinking of buying, and it gives a traffic light rating for the company that makes that product. And ba this is based on the policies that company has around sustainable palm oil. So the more people that download and use this app, the more it will help drive demand. And this influence will lead to more sustainable agricultural practices and more space for wildlife. And it will also help to contribute to addressing climate change. We're also magnifying our influence through our partnerships with retailers and suppliers and restaurants to drive up demand for sustainable palm oil in their supply chains. We started here in Chester, and in 2019, Chester became the world's first sustainable palm oil city. We've embedded sustainable palm oil purchasing across Chester Zoo in all our operations. And now we're setting our sights on other products and other commodities in our major supply chains that can also cause deforestation. We're talking to government who will be bringing in legislation to require companies to ensure that they are not contributing to further deforestation across the globe via their supply chains for a number of key commodities. And these include palm oil, but also soya, coffee and beef. In fact, I was in Parliament only last week talking to MPs of all parties about this very issue. So, please join us and help to end deforestation and provide a better future for wildlife through Shopping Smart. Seize your opportunity to influence today. If you do, you will be doing your bit to help reverse the nature and climate crisis. What's more, you will be helping to ensure that children like Monty grow up in a world rich in biodiversity and full of the wonders of the natural world. Don't we owe that to the next generation? Thank you.